Paul Servino was making his way in the world of advertising when something in his gut told him to go back to the theater. As it turns out, that something was a budding ulcer, and Servino took the cue. His big break came a few years later in 1972 when he read for an off-Broadway play called That Championship Season. Producer Joe Papp liked what he saw, and Servino has never looked back. Recently, you remember him for acclaimed performances as Lift Manless in Dick Tracy and Mafia Don Paul Cicero in, Cicero in Goodfellas. He is currently starring in NBC's smart and gritty drama Law and & Order. And if all goes well, someday, someday, he might reach his ultimate goal, which as many of you know, is to sing at the Met. We're pleased to have Paul Trevino here. Uh, very pleased. Welcome. Thank you. It's true. I mean, if you could do anything, if I could say here, I have in my pocket a gift and you would say an invitation to sing at the Met would be it. Yes, but it's, it's not just the invitation, because even if I had the invitation, if I didn't feel I was ready, I wouldn't take it. Yeah. So the real gift to me would be, in your pocket, you take out uh, something that says, you're ready. Yeah. But that's still a couple of months away. But what I'm almost ready now. <laughs> are actually. you really? Yes. Uh -huh. and, and how are you getting ready? I take five or six lessons a week, two hours a day, yeah. uh, with uh, Maestro Hugo De Caro, yeah. who is the preeminent voice teacher in the world. Are you a tenor? Yes. And if you could be someone, who would it be? I mean, someone. Paul someone Servino. <laughs> I know that. Good heavens. Yeah, Why would but I, I mean, want to be anyone but, else. But anyone, would you be, um, well, who? I mean, among the great tenors. Would, is anybody that. Well, if you said I had to be someone other than myself, I would say I would like to have been in Enrico Caruso. Well, Car uh, yeah, Caruso. Yeah. I guess uh, yeah. all great tenors would say Caruso. Oh, well, sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he his instrument was, was just better. He had many things besides. There have been other instruments that probably were in his league. Yeah. But no one had an instrument and a technical superiority and a mind and a heart that he did all put into one person, plus personality, charisma, and generosity. And it's an awful lot in one man. And how, he died when he was 54, 55? 48. 48? Mm -hmm. yeah, of what? Pleurisy. Yeah. Why didn't you be stay in opera then? Why didn't you... You know, uh, I'm glad this is a long. This is more than the five or six <laughs> minutes of the uh, yes. of the typical talk show that that I do. This uh, is not the typical talk show. No, it's not at all. That's why I'm so happy to be here. Uh, there are probably ten thousand voice teachers in this city, yeah. and uh, for the most part, they don't know what they're doing. I had a number of voice teachers, some well-meaning and some not well-meaning. It is probably the greatest. Uh, uh, area for fraud, legal fraud in the world. I studied uh, for many years and got nowhere. I studied on uh, certain, some teachers gave me scholarships. I had, I had probably $100,000 worth of scholarships, vocal scholarships. I was also an acting student scholarship, mm -hmm. uh, an acting scholarship student. But there were so many people who were trying to do something with my voice and couldn't, and it was their problem, not mine. Oh, granted, my voice is difficult to train because I'm a dramatic tenor. It's a, it's a, um, a baritonal color yeah. in a tenor voice. Trying to like uh, park a, 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 a tank in a, in a Volkswagen space, it right. doesn't really want to go there. But are you saying? Because <coughs> this resonates with me. Yeah. Are you saying that that the right teacher had not come put along you... until Hugo De Caro? Simple as that. And if Hugo De Caro, if Hugo De Caro and I had gotten together 30 years ago. It's my assumption that I would have been singing for the last quarter of a century and more. It wasn't to be. Yeah. My career and life was to take a different turn, but now it's and to it's take been, another. And it's been a good life. But it the has. point is that I think in all professions there are teachers like that. I mean, that, that we've got too many people who stifle rather than inspire yeah. and teach and raise. And with great yeah. credit to a lot of great teachers, too many cases in which young people yeah. who yearn to do something yes. Find it kept. But it is much more difficult with the voice because you're working by radar. Yeah. A piano teacher, uh, if you start to put your hands on the piano in this manner, <laughs> he's going to say, no, don't do that, do yeah, this. Right. In the voice, it takes an extraordinary pair of ears to tell you what you're doing wrong and how to yeah. correct it. If there's so much coordination of the body. There's no such thing as a great natural singer who lasts. The, great, the greatest singers of the century, the tenors, Enrico Caruso and Beniamino Gigli, both were thought of by their te first teachers as being untalented. Caruso was told that he had a whistle of a voice, sounded like the wind going through the shutters. Yeah. He had to sit in the back. His teacher wouldn't let him sit up front with the other students. Uh, Benemino Gigli, after three years at the conservatoire, was told, you have to leave. Yeah. He said, well, can I at least well, sing in the chorus? He yeah, said, not but, even in the chorus. But does that raise the question that if you had wanted it badly and wanted it more, you would have found that teacher earlier? I looked very hard. I, no one wanted it more than I. Yeah. 
No one wanted it more so than I. So we can I never say you. that you weren't hungry enough oh, for it. Oh, I've been hungry since the first day I opened my mouth at eight or nine and said, I think I have a voice. And was it because you recognized that you had the voice? I mean, was it because, Ted Williams once said to me, he said, why'd you become a hitter? He said, I was just good at it. And the more I did it, the more people encouraged me. The yeah. more they encouraged me, the yeah. more I wanted to do it. You know, he had a natural gift for hitting yeah. a baseball. Right. Are you saying you had that same thing and, and, and that's what you knew and that's why you wanted to do it? Yes. I also was drawn like a, as a moth to a flame because somehow the sound of the human voice has always been fascinating to me. From I'm the last generation to have appreciated radio in its heyday. I grew up listening to radio dramas. Yeah. And so uh, I, by the time I was 10 years old, could identify all the announcers by name, all the actors on the shows, yeah. because I was so fascinated by the human voice. Yeah. D you also, to be that good, do you have to have a great ear? I, I, may be I would assume that, uh, that uh, that's what it takes, but don't forget a tenor or a singer doesn't listen to himself when he sings. Yeah, that's what he I'm does a, He accomplishes certain technical things, and the result comes out. If he starts listening too much to himself, he's going to throw off the coordination. Paul Servino is here. Let me talk, turn to acting. So at some point you said, not opera, but acting, or did you say, I'm going to go do this and maybe I'll come back in the back door? No, it didn't work that way. I wanted to be an actor from the time I was four. Yeah. So uh, I remember the moment... And the acting would find expression in the opera. Well, right. I remember when I was four, I stood up to my full four feet or whatever I was then and said, uh, Mommy, when I grow up, I want, I'm going to be an actor. She remembers the moment. Uh, she's passed on now, but she remembered the moment and... Uh, I, for some reason, probably because my uncle was a tenor, and when he came to the house, this chiming, beautiful voice would ex expose itself, and I was so fascinated by that. Well, it turns out that I developed my own voice, but I always loved acting, and I always wanted to be an actor. What happened is I developed a voice at eight or nine and started following that, too. Acting was easier for me to accomplish. The technique involved was easy, more easily acquired. It was more visible. It wasn't the radar-like uh, blind searching that yeah. you do for the voice, for the coordination, because if you're acting, a teacher can, can look and say, well, that, there's a way to do that, and that's not it, yeah. and I can show you a way to right. do it, as Sanford Meisner and Bill Esper and my right. teachers showed me. Uh, and I had a certain gift for that, too. I mean, I had a certain expressiveness. That's, that's, you're born with that, and a certain desire to do it. Any acting in your family? No. No, no. none. You said about um, <laughs> Goodfellas, it was a deep investigation in myself, the bottom of a human being. I can't even describe it, but it was the most significant thing I've done. I had to go someplace I hadn't gone before, and I proved that I could do it. It frightened me and left me physically ill, and I feel different as a person for having done it. I've forgotten that I'd said that, but it's, every word is true. What are you talking about? We were just discussing technique, right. um, singing technique and now acting technique. That's a on the one hand, difficult to acquire. On the other hand, difficult to maintain. This was beyond technique. Uh, if you ask me to display an emotion, I, can, I technically know where to go to bring that emotion out organically. If you ask me to weep, I will weep for you. I will not fake it. I won't put glycerin in my eyes. I will find the place in me There's that causes that me to weep. To cry, right? Yes. But when you ask me to express a certain lethality, yeah. uh, to limb the uh, unconscious of a murderer, of a killer, a person who could kiss his grandchild and order your death in the next breath. I don't know what that is. And I was, when I took the role, I took it expressing to everyone that I knew exactly what to do when I knew nothing of how to do it. Uh, I knew I knew the externals of the role. It merely required a, a Brooklyn, um, a middle-aged uh, Italian-American accent. Voice was easy for you. Well, that's easy. I mean, so I've done that plenty of times. What's that? That's not. So where'd you find it? That's not discussable even. Uh, all I did was keep saying, "Where is it?" Yeah. I kept talking to myself for two months, every day in and day out, f looking for the place that would justify this lethality, this coldness, and yet maintain a warm side, because just a coldness is. That's just an automaton. That's one dimension. person who's killed himself off. Pauli Cicero had not killed himself off, but a certain part of him was absolutely dead. Yeah. That deep part of him that was cold and dead. And I found that. And when I found that, I scared myself with it. You understand? Yeah. It frightened the hell out of me because I didn't suspect it, even in me. I did not suspect it was a part of my building blocks. 
And one day I was crossing a mirror as I'd been working on it. I literally was jolted. I saw a dead look in my eyes. I said, now I know the role, but that's frightening. So to tell you that I made a wonderful technical exploration, I couldn't. I happened on it. It's like a, a geologist. <laughs> I don't know if there's anything in here, but I'm going to keep looking because I can't go back and And it was a lethality. Two days, yeah. two days before I had to do it. Uh, a lethality, that coldness, yeah, yeah, that, right. that right. I know, I know. ability to quash all respect for other human life and accomplish whatever murderous And still love nefarious. your own grandchild Absolutely, with, with great sincerity. And, and touch your dog or whatever. And to love a Henry Hill. Yeah, and hit your brother. In a sense. I mean, uh, just, and my crew and the people and all, and to love them to the point to where Henry Hill brought him down. Yeah. <clears throat> so that to me was a fascinating individual. And the, the scene <clears throat> in which you're slicing, what was the scene? You, you were... Oh, I was uh, slicing the garlic. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me about that scene. Well, that... Uh, the, the fellow that I played in life did that. That's in the book Wise yeah, Guy right. and about the fellow Paulie that I did played. Did you tell you about the guy? Or no, not a word. And you see, it doesn't help uh, in my, at least the way I work, to actually find out facts about a person. Uh, if I were to do, let's say, uh, at one point I was going to do Babe Ruth, and um, I looked at the Goodman role, the John Goodman? Case? Yes, the yeah, Goodman, right. but I, not that film. Right. You, a few years back, I was going to do a film about him. And I, I backed out of it because it was, the material wasn't good enough, ultimately. But I'd worked on the character, and I'd found the character. But I did that by watching him on film and listening to him and found what it was so I could reconstruct it. Uh, we was uh, one by two or three, and we, we was one on the square. That's the way he talked, Babe yeah. Ruth. Yeah. And, uh, and I had gotten his swing. I had gotten his physicality. And it also led me to an inside. Sometimes the, ex the external search can lead you to the inside. Not with good fellows. The, the, the inside had seemingly no connection with the outside. Yeah. So, what was the question? I no, think no, I no. But my question, my, my question wa what was the sli the the, the oh, well, garlic? Oh, just he actually sliced garlic with a razor blade, yeah. and so that's what I did. I just yeah. manicured my fingernails with a close shot. Yeah, that, that's then something that you would imagine him to know him that he would do that. <coughs> Precision would allow him to do that. Yeah, imagine the concentration that he yeah. would do, be desirous of doing that. People wonder with all the talent, with that extraordinary performance, and this is not to demean an, an industry and a business that I have great affection for, why are you doing this? Roll tape, take a look at Law & Order, a highly praised series on television. Here it is, Paul Servino and others. Paul Servino, why do you do that? I mean, everybody praises it, you, it but it's television, uh, and people say, after Goodfellas, where you were brilliant, uh, why aren't you just going out and doing one film after another? There isn't. One film. One film. <laughs> there aren't one film <laughs> after another. Um, uh, and this was a role you could there love. There are a couple of reasons that I'm doing it. Uh, a large part of why I'm doing it is that um, my mother was very ill, and I knew this would be her last year of life, and I didn't want to mm -hmm. go uh, on location anywhere. I wanted to spend this last year. She was living with us. My wife and I were, were recently mar remarried right. uh, 10 months. My wife insisted that my mother there come and live with us, and she, they loved each other very much. Yeah. And uh, it was my thought that if I worked in New York, we would have these last time. She did not last very long, Mercif mercifully, as it turns out, because yeah. with cancer, uh, the suffering could have been extreme. It wasn't, and it was quick. And, but uh, you were here. But I was here. Uh, the other part of it, of course, is that the material, to my mind, and I know that it's going to be said as biased, but to my mind, it's the best dramatic show in many years on television. Uh, because of the writing? The writing, the acting, the directing, the mm -hmm. production. Joe Stern, the producer who, who, mm -hmm. who is on the line all the time doing it. Dick Wolf, the integrity involved in the show, the commitment by Universal to keep it here in New York, which is where it must mm -hmm. be to maintain its, its gritty uh, substance. So uh, uh, the quality of the show, uh, the fact that I would be in my own uh, home, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that timing is everything. Uh, certainly there were other opportunities. Certainly there are other opportunities. I'm not sorry I made this choice. I'm involved in it very much. I enjoy working there. The hours are a little long, but yeah. uh, I'm learning to pace myself. Thank you. Thank you Let's so much. Let's do it again. I want to have you come back and just talk about something other than your own career, because I know you're I interested like in to. politics and the condition of the city and a Indeed, lot of other Indeed, I'm things. involved in all of it, like we all are. Pleasure. Thank, Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Trevino's latest film is the role of former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger in the Oliver Stone movie, Nixon. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Charlie. It's good to have you. Uh, tell me about preparing for Kissinger, someone who's here amidst us, someone that we see on this show and you see around and, and you know, so you... <clears throat> 
Well, you, you know, uh, when you do something like Kissinger, uh, it's a daunting challenge, but it's a challenge that I love. Uh, I, and, uh, I enjoy doing difficult things. I like scaling mountains. I like uh, climbing heights. And I like, I like a, a difficult task. Uh, and the fun of acting is approximating other human beings vocally, um, behaviorally, um, and attitudinally. And you do this by a lot of preparation, laborious preparation. That is to say, if you're doing someone with idiosyncratic speech like Dr. Kissinger, you have to go into uh, hibernation with, that, with your tape recorder and his tapes. Mm -hmm. And you watch and you listen and you record. And you watch and you listen and you record. I was able to do the voice uh, at a party once, just did it, and it was fine. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't give you the person. That's a parlor trick or that's an impressionist's result, such as a Freddie Travellina or uh, or Rich Little, right. who do these things brilliantly. But once they get to that point, their work is done. Once they sound like the character, or minimally look like the character, that's quite enough, and it's enough to entertain us royally. But the actor has to go much deeper. That's a third of our work, perhaps, or maybe even a fifth of our work. Because the real work, then, uh, is involved in reaching a state where you synthesize all the elements. Everything gets together. Everything becomes organically unified. The sum is greater than its parts. What did you find when you went beyond the voice and the mannerisms? Uh, what, did, what was there that you wanted to somehow say, this is the essence of the Henry Kissinger I found? There is no one on this planet who can identify what produces that feeling. Um, it's a feeling of possession in a certain sense. It's, a, it's mystical. One uh, prepares his tools, sets up his workbench, and goes about readily teachable and learnable methods yeah. to achieve uh, his goal. However, one fellow does it, and he goes this far. Another fellow does it, and he's on the other side of the table. We don't know why. Yeah. We don't know how. And some only go this far. They're called craftsmen. The ones who jump the other side are called artists. Yes. It is a, there's a, a mystery. There's a gulf there. There's a gap in the tape, if you will, that has not been explained to us. I do know that when really good actors do this kind of work, there is a certain point at which all of a sudden you feel like it. And there is no way to identify that except to say, I have reached a feeling. I have reached uh, um, uh, ground zero with the character. Here I am. I feel it. It happened two days before Goodfellas when I was doing uh, Paulie and Goodfellas. It happened... Um, Oh, about a week before I did uh, uh, Nixon. You just, all of a sudden, you put that work together, and there it is, and you are that person, and you can't make a bad move. You can't make a bad move. You can't. And, and, but it's it like if, if, I, if my acting teacher used to say, if you put a gun to the back of a ballet dancer, Sanford Meisner would say, and say, stick him up, he will do this. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is character acting, because this is, a character does certain things. Yeah. A person who is a cringer will cringe. A person who is a bellower will bellow. That's, that's, in the simplest terms, that's what character acting is. All good acting is character acting. But what I'm saying to you is, once you find the character inside you, and it's a feeling, it's like first learning to ride the bike. When you feel it, you know how to ride the bike. It's a feeling. Mm. Uh, once you find that, you can't make a wrong move because your guy wouldn't do anything that, that isn't within those parameters. And the understanding we will come away from this movie of Henry Kissinger is... 60% of the script and 40% acting or what? I mean, what's the com I mean, the insight into Kissinger is the insight of Oliver Stone and the screenwriter, is it not? Yes. First and what you have done is made it believable yes. and real as it could possibly be. That's our task. Uh, the, the artist in this, uh, in this case is uh, the artists are the writers, uh, but the, the major artist in any film is the director. Right. There may be artists in the film who are actors, but they are not there to contribute their art. They're there to contribute their craft. It is not art that we engage in in a movie because we don't sign our work. You will not see any of our performances in those films. You will see Oliver's and the editor's concept of our performances. Yeah. They assemble them in a certain way you, that gives you their impression yeah. of you your performance. You give them the clay and they mold it. Exactly. In their movie. Yes. But the better clay you give them, the better molding they'll do. Yeah, all right, you exactly. Know? I mean, that, that's and a the fact. Better, and the better also, the end result will be. Oh, indeed. Also, and when you show up the first day, 
your artistic work is done, but it is artistic work. The characterological development that you bring to bear on the first day of rehearsal is indeed your artistry. Yeah. If you don't have it, you come half-baked. You're not convincing. It's not together. It's still in pieces. It's parts not connected, not unified. And most directors I've interviewed will tell you <coughs> that 70, 50 to 70 percent of the movie is the casting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So by choosing you, yes, knowing that you would deliver what you would deliver. Yes. Why did Oliver tell you he wanted you to play Henry Kissinger? Oh, but he didn't. He never did. No, what happened was uh, he wanted to see me. Um, and uh, I said, well, why should I have a meeting with Oliver? I haven't read this uh, <laughs> script. Uh, he has, uh, I have no idea what it would be. I don't know if I'm interested. And I don't know, he might just be wanting to say hello and see if he gets ideas. I see no reason to take that kind of meeting. So my agent said, no, I think you better go because <laughs> he has you in mind for a specific role. Yeah. I said, okay, hearing that, then I'll go. So I went and I walk in and he said, uh, you know, Oliver talks like this, you know, Oliver. Mm -hmm. And he says, uh, uh, yeah, had you in mind for uh, Hoover, but you're, you're kind of tall. How tall are you, 5'10", 5 5'11"? 5 and I said, no, I'm taller than that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so he says, uh, no, I'm 6'3". I know. So, so he says, uh, yeah, uh, Hoover's a kind of bulldog, a terrier. I said, yes. I said, my wife thinks I ought to play Kissinger. And uh, he says, Kissinger? And I said, Yes, well, I think if I play Dr. Kissinger, I could uh, represent him in an effective and um, uh, honest way. I admire the man, and I uh, know quite a bit about him, and I believe that I could express Dr. Kissinger uh, in an optimum fashion for your movie. He looks at me. He says, do you want to, go to, you want to take the script and come back sometime? I said, no. He said, do you want to take it downstairs and look at it? I said, no. He's wondering what, uh, what this fellow is, what, what is this, this lunatic here? I said, I'll tell you what, you just tell me what's in the scene. Yeah. I didn't come to read, and which I didn't. I came to meet him. I said, however, you tell me what's in the scene, and I'll read it. He looks at me. He says, you've got a lot of confidence. I said, yes. So do you. You're a great filmmaker. I'm a good actor. I, you know, I have a lot of confidence. So Billy Hopkins, the casting director, who is not Anthony Hopkins, by the way, uh, reads with me. I know Billy. Yeah. Very nice guy. Very good casting director, but not Anthony Hopkins' actor. And we do the scene, the praying scene with Anthony, uh, that Anthony did so beautifully. And at, I did it with the character and the emotion. Yeah. And uh, modesty forbids repeating what Oliver said about my reading. Just tell me. Though. I cannot. All right, go ahead. He said, well, he said it was the best audition he ever saw. Best cold reading he ever saw. <laughs> That's what he said. Okay. Which is very nice of him to say. He said, that is the best cold reading I ever saw. He was taken with it. And I, I knew that, it was, that, I, that I had scored well. He said... Uh, and uh, he walked out with his arm around my shoulder, and I went home and said, I can't get this role. I'm too tall. Uh, no one will uh, let me escape from the uh, Scorsesean aura of the Mafia Don that I created in Goodfellas. I've been typed, finally, to my detriment, but that's where it is. The studio will say, no, no, not him. Yeah. He's, a, he's a Mafia guy. He's, yeah. That's what he plays, tough guys and so forth. And uh, two days later, uh, they said, uh, expect an, order, uh, an offer tomorrow. That's exactly what happened, because once Oliver had decided that I was the one to play it, even though I'm a good deal taller than Dr. Kissinger, that he knew that I could play it. He knew I would play it. He knew I would give everything to it. He, that was it. But to listen to you and hear that voice, and Henry Kissinger sat where you are sitting yes. now 50 times. Yes. The voice is almost perfect. Well, uh, also, when you see the movie, you will see not only, you see, it's, it's not only, you see, the voice is the voice. The voice is one thing, but if you, there is another matter. This is what, uh, it's you see, uh, it's the, uh, well, it's that one thing that you asked about, what is the character? Now, uh, this is not uh, Paul Sorvino talking. This is Paul Sorvino talking. If I even just did the voice, this would be it, you see, but that's not Dr. Kissinger. That's just the voice. But if I tell you that uh, there is an attitude that comes from inside, and it is a character that um, uh, with you deal with geopolitical realities and triangular diplomacy. You must always let the other fellow think he knows what you're thinking, but you cannot allow it. And when I met him, I discovered a strength that you don't see on television because his, his persona on television is to come off as the sage yeah. counselor, the advisor, the analyzer. And I love to watch him on television, especially when there are three or four other um, esteemed experts on, because they give their opinion. It comes to Dr. Kissinger, and in the most concise, 
succinct way, he completely obliterates everything everybody else said because you understand that his oracular vision is tied somewhere to the, the center of the earth. Mm -hmm. That what he says is so uh, steeped in his extraordinary knowledge, uh, his scholarship that goes back millennia regarding the affairs of nations and peoples with one another, that it is, his conclusions seem inescapable. They seem rooted in such bedrock reality. Did you talk to him? I did. Before you did the role? During. I couldn't During. get to, yeah, I wanted to do it before, but we couldn't do it. They had a wrong digit in one of my, in my telephone number, so they <laughs> didn't get to me no. in time. Oh, oh, you called them. And I they called them, yes. I called and said, I'd like to speak to Dr. Kissinger. I'm playing him in the Oliver Kissinger's Stone movie. Kissinger's office screwed the message. Exactly. Okay. And I said, I'd like to uh, uh, speak with him. I think it behooves both of us to meet. I want to do an accurate representation of Dr. Kissinger. I'm a, uh, an admirer of his. And I think people will remember him uh, greatly, perhaps, if this movie is successful for what I do. He said, I think this will be a wonderful idea. I'll check with Dr. Kissinger. I didn't hear from them. And finally, I heard from them. They finally got the right number somehow. And uh, I, uh, the meeting was arranged. I went there with my wife. Uh, to his apartment, to rest, no, to his, lunch, uh, his to, offices to his on office, Park okay. Avenue. And we were to have an hour, and we had an hour and a half. He didn't want to let us go. Be At first, he was quite wary, chary of this big Italian playing uh, this uh, extraordinary Jewish intellectual. Yeah. And um, uh, we hadn't much in common in, um, educationally, except that my daughter went to Harvard, where he was a professor and was an honors graduate as well. Uh, so, at least genetically speaking, I have some credentials to meet with the, and to express uh, the greatness <laughs> of Dr. Kissinger. And uh, he liked that, that Mira, you know, my actress daughter Mira, uh, uh, had gone to Harvard, and we talked yeah. about that, and we talked about uh, him and his ideas of, the, other, of the, the time, his attitudes towards people of the time, his attitudes towards Nixon. And his, really, what do you say about Nixon? Well, he said that, uh, he said, I'll tell you what he said about the script, if you don't mind. Uh, he had read the script. He said, I don't necessarily hold any belief for uh, Oliver Nixon, but uh, Oliver, but uh, uh, the script is a, a, a very truthful representation of his tragic life. It, it, it didn't have to happen. He brought it on himself. And that's how he sees Kissinger. I mean, that's how Kissinger, Kissinger sees, sees Nixon, Nixon that as way. a tragic figure. As a tragic figure. And I wondered how he'd gotten it, but I guess if you, you know, we were uh, on pain of lawsuit, not allowed to divulge the contents of these scripts and but you want and he must have gotten it reconstructed from Oliver Stone's shredder or something it's ex astonishing that he could have read the script how he got it no one knows <laughs> but his impression was he said of course it makes me may look like a major slime ball but it doesn't matter it's not a big part anyway so uh, but his his feelings about Nixon were that he had a great mind he told me this that he had an extraordinary grasp of uh, foreign affairs uh, that uh, was an absolutely brilliant man. And he talked about this one and that one, and, and he talked about the fact that, of course, he spent a great deal of time with Nixon every day. They spent hours discussing foreign policy every single day. That's not shown in the movie because it's not dramatic. But Kissinger, it is said, also was, in a sense, insecure about, a little bit about his relationship with some of the Nixon people as to whether you know, he was an outsider. He said, for example, yeah, yeah. he hadn't been to dinner in the, with the family in the family quarters or something. Right. You know, had a sense that he was an outsider. He was an outsider. And Nixon may have seen him that way in <coughs> part because he, you know, was Nelson Rockefeller's foreign I think policy he advisor always, who came exactly. under the Nixon team. I also at feel the end. that Nixon, you see, uh, Kissinger is a member of the intellectual, Eastern intellectual establishment. To, into which Nixon would have given his left arm to enter. Uh, he always, you know, he was, uh, got a scholarship to Harvard but wasn't given subsistence. In those days they gave you the scholarship but not the money to live there. And he couldn't take the scholarship to Harvard. He, because Nixon himself at Whittier was a, a summa, uh, at the high school was a straight A student, mm -hmm. and then went to Whittier College and was a summa cum laude as well. Uh, I just feel that he was, oh, Nixon himself was always the outsider. And he made others outsiders. His uh, uh, constructed personality uh, was there to keep you out. It was not just to, um, uh, to let's say, if you need a, uh, a deal with the Russians, you send Henry in. He'll get it for you. Uh, that persona that he constructed was there to protect himself. He was a frightened man in a certain sense, pushing out 
anything close, anything that would touch his vulnerability, which was vast, apparently, under these, those, those plates, which shifted every now and then, you know? Let's take a look at it. This, is, this clip is Clean House. Tell me, set up the clip for me. Uh, clean House. Uh, I suggest it, the, the pressure on the presidency is enormous at this point. And uh, they're getting closer. The Watergate uh, investigators and the public and the press are, uh, are doing more than making innuendos about Nixon's, uh, Nixon's involvement. Yeah. And so here, Dr. Kissinger is saying, we know what you have to do. You have to do something because if you don't start uh, throwing some, uh, some of the ballast overboard, you're going to sink with the ship. Roll tape. Here it is. Now, we all know that you are clean, right? Then let's take off the gloves. Let's do a house cleaning. House cleaning? Oh, it could be ugly, Henry. Really ugly. It must be done, sir. Your government is oh, bad. It could come out the uh, Ellsberg thing. Yeah, even you knew about that one, didn't you, Henry? Well, I heard something. It sounded idiotic. Idiotic, I suppose it was. I thought it was your idea to expose uh, Ellsberg as a sex fiend. I guess uh, somebody just took you too literally. I never suggested that a bunch of imbeciles break into a psychiatrist. It doesn't salon. matter, Henry. The point is you might lose some of your meteor darling halo if the media start sniffing around our dirty laundry. Sir, I never had anything to do with that, and I resent the implication that Send I... Send it all you want, Henry. But you're in with the rest of us. Cambodia, Ellsberg, the wiretaps you put in. The president wants you to know you can't just click your heels and head back to Harvard Yard. It's your ass too, Henry. And it's in the wind, twisting with everyone else's. Sir. Yeah? There are times when even the president can go too far. Wow. <laughs> Makeup. Yes. Tell me about it. Three hours in the beginning. We got it down to about an hour and a half or an hour and 45 minutes. Took about a half hour to 45 minutes to get off. Uh, the great uh, prosthetic makeup artist Gordon Smith uh, did the nose, yeah. and uh, I wore a prosthetic uh, uh, device to push the lip out, the lower lip out. I wore contact lenses to change the color of my eyes. I wore added on things added on to my eyebrows. I, I wore a wig. Did you do anything to reduce the height thing? No, I don't look tall anyway. No. Almost everyone thinks I'm 5'8". So even if I stand next to people, <laughs> I'm taller than almost everybody in the movie. I yeah. think I am the tallest sure. in the movie. Hopkins about 5'11", 6", isn't he? No, no. No, shorter. No, that's what I mean. You see, even though I'm standing next to him, yeah. you get the impression that I'm short. How tall is Hopkins? Oh, I don't think he's more than 5'9", five, five, okay. five, maybe. Yeah. Maybe he's 5'10". I, I doubt it. I would think 5'9". Yeah. Uh, Jimmy is fairly tall, as no, you know. He's about 5'11", yeah. or, or close to 6". But uh, oh, they all look taller than I do. Everybody does, and I'm 6'3". Now, why is that? Well, you know that I'm a singer, as you've mentioned, yes. that I'm a tenor. I have the body of a tenor and the legs of a bass. But <laughs> tenors are barrel-chested, yeah. low, deep neck, you know, compressed with yeah. broad faces and broad visage and, uh, and uh, big barrel chests and short legs. I have everything but the short legs. I have very long legs. Basses are like you. you yeah. Your basses are all built, built like you, like Jerome Hines. You, you guys all look alike. Sam Raimi, you all those. And you are sort of a bass. If you sang in the opera, you'd probably be a bass. Probably. Yeah, that's, what the, that's the look. Well, the tenors are all this barrel-chested characters, you know, so that they can, ah, they can get it out, you know. Listen to the people you work with. Mike Nichols. Yes. Martin Scorsese. Yes. Warren Beatty. Uh, yes. His directors. Yes. Oliver Stone. Yeah. William Friedkin, mm -hmm. Carl Reiner, Sidney Pollack. Wow. Yeah. I've been there. I've been to the mountaintop, but I haven't been the guide. <laughs> I've been a passenger on the bus. I haven't been the driver. Well, I hope you get it. Well, let's see. I, I'm, I'm waiting around. We'll see. Paul, great to have you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next time. See you then.